What I'm going to do today is uh, zoom in to the savanna of the present. So this is an illustration of the context that I work in. And um, it's the northern part of northwest Kenya that you're seeing here. Uh, this is a picture taken during the dry season. And that means that part of the grazing, most of the grazing lands on the plains have been depleted. And this family, pictured over here, have most likely gone to the mountains in the morning to graze their animals. And by midday, they have come down to this dry riverbed. They've dug a well here in this riverbed, and they're watering their animals right now. So the household pictured here belong to a group of people called the Quatella who are a sub-territory of a larger group of people called the Turkana. And the Quatella themselves are a large population. They number anywhere between 50 to 100,000 people, which is um, you know, a substantial um, number of people. And yet, the Quatella are actually sharing these grazing lands with all the other Quatella. So these grazing lands are the co commons. Um, on the other side of this mountain um, is South Sudan, literally. And here there's a population of pastoralists called the Taposa. And in the dry season, it's not just this family you see here that wants to use the pastures up in those mountains. And for that matter, it's not just other Quatella who want to use it either. The Taposa on the other side of the mountain want to use these pastures. And so do Turkana individuals who come from 100 kilometers south of here who belong to yet another sub-territory of the Turkana. So if you are a household here, you are sharing these pastures with some people, actually with a lot of people. You're sharing it with 50 to 100,000 other Quatella people, maybe even more. And you're not sharing it with some other people. You're willing to fight another group of people so that you and your people can have access to these pastures. So that is the, um, the effect of large-scale cooperation that humans are capable of. And the converse side of large-scale cooperation, which is intergroup conflict. And that is what my research is focused on. So one interesting thing is that uh, when people think about human origins research in the Turkana area, this is not what they usually think of. They're mostly thinking about um, some of the most prominent findings that have shaped our understanding of human evolution that have come from sites that are actually really close to the, where this picture was that I showed you. So the Nariokotame site is where the uh, almost complete skeleton of an individual who lived 1.5 million years ago was found. Um, and Lamequi 3 uh, is another site in which the oldest stone tool has been found dating to 3.3 million years ago. And clearly, these are really important um, for understanding the human origin story. So most people, when they think about human origins research, are then thinking about excavations and uh, the type of geological, archaeological, or um, paleoanthropological research projects. Sometimes they think about genetics research that allows us to peer into the past. Sometimes they think about studies of our um, most um, uh, closest living uh, relatives, the chimps and the bonobos. But what I'm doing is studying a contemporary population living here. And um, these are pastoralists who live a semi-nomadic lifestyle. Um, and one of the things, main things that we do is that we go up to these settlements where these people live and we spend a lot of time talking to these people. 
So we do interviews, we do surveys, we do experiments in which we are trying to elicit people's preferences, people's psychological dispositions, people's behavioral choices when they're presented with trade-offs about who they might cooperate with, who they might take stuff from, etc. And the question then is what can we learn about human origins from the studies of contemporary populations. Clearly, we can learn a lot about contemporary populations, but what do we learn about human origins by studying contemporary populations? And the answer to that question is um, a lot. And one reason for that is that we can probe the psychology and preferences of contemporary populations in a way that we simply cannot ever have access to with past populations. And it is really important to know this in order to fill in the gaps in understanding the larger picture of human evolution, especially to understand what have been some of the key selection pressures that have shaped human evolution. But we need, there is a missing link. We need something to connect what we see in the present to making some inference about something in the past. And that is, what we need is evolutionary theories about behavioral adaptations. These are theories that generate specific predictions, specific hypotheses and predictions that we can then test in contemporary populations. And by confirming or rejecting these hypotheses, we can learn about what were the kinds of evolutionary pressures that played a big role versus small role versus no role in shaping um, how our brain behavior, cognition, preferences eventually um, came to be what it is today. So um, picking up on something that uh, Denise emphasized, humans are really special in that we are really flexible. Behavioral flexibility is one of the key features of our adaptive repertoire. And because of that, behaviors are going, to, even though we're thinking about species-wide behavioral adaptations, these behaviors are going to be expressed in different ways and at different levels in different populations. And we can use that to our advantage by choosing the right population to study the right kinds of questions. Different populations will be amenable to being able to see more clearly the effect of one behavior on another, etc. That is uh, what has led me to work with the Tracana in um, my desire to understand the roots of large-scale cooperation in humans and the role of intergroup conflict in sculpting that large-scale cooperation. So what is, uh, about, what's, what is it about the Tracana that make them suitable to answer these questions? There are a few things, but the one thing I'll point out here is that they are a politically decentralized society. So there is no centralized leadership. There's no centralized course of institutions and authority by which people can make somebody else do something that is not in their own interest. Yet, the Turkana are basically cooperating, maintaining social order at this really large scale, cooperating at these really large scales, even without somebody forcing them to do it. And so that is a great context for us to be able to understand what are the individual dispositions that humans possess that allow these kind of bottom-up processes to shape um, human um, human evolution, human social evolution, human cultural evolution. So one of the contexts in which they do this kind of cooperation is in the context of cattle raiding. 
So uh, people, uh, a large number of people um, will come together, they'll coordinate an attack against another group, and the group that basically overcomes their opponents, um, they are able to drive away a large number of livestock that belong to the opponent, and they're also able to displace the people who are settled in that grazing area and get access to that grazing area. And that is really valuable dry season grazing lands, the limiting grazing lands in, the, in this context. And so the problem here is that, as you know, when you disperse people from, one grazing, from these grazing lands, it's not just you who have rights to those grazing lands. It's a whole 100,000 other people who have rights to those grazing lands. Yet, uh, yet when you go out on these raids, you suffer a 1% chance of being killed on the raid, a rate of mortality that ends up leading to 50% of adult male mortality in the, uh, uh, in the context of raiding. So this is an individually costly thing to do, and the benefits of this is something that flows not just back to the individual who's bearing the cost, but to a larger group of people. And this raises the question, how do humans do it? Well, they must have some behavioral adaptations that allow people who cooperate in this way to somehow do better than those who are not cooperating. So what are these behavioral adaptations? Well, there are several hypotheses, and one of them is um, that humans have evolved this capacity for large-scale cooperation through third-party punishment of non-cooperators, which means that if somebody doesn't do what they are supposed to do and contribute, the rest of us are willing to impose a cost on that individual by sanctioning that individual, by disapproving of them, by refusing to help them. And these social costs become big enough that it actually is in the best interest of that individual to just go ahead and cooperate. So that is a hypothesis for why and how humans are able to sustain cooperation. And um, so when we go out to study these populations, these contemporary populations, we can ask this question. So do third parties punish? And when they punish, are they punishing free riders, individuals who are not contributing because they don't want to put in the cost, the risk associated with this activity? And um, this is just one example of the kinds of studies we do. This is a vignette study in which people are presented with a scenario in which a Turkana warrior was a coward on a raid and endangered the lives of other people that he was with. And in contrast with another scenario in which they're hearing about a warrior who actually made an effort, but he was not very competent, he didn't have the skills, and so he didn't end up actually contributing much, uh, but it's not free riding. Same impact but different causes and pathways for, uh, for why. And we see that people do have a lot more negative sentiments towards this individual who's a free rider, who's not cooperating. And um, that shows up in a variety of contexts. We judge these people. We judge what they, uh, what they do to be wrong. We are willing to criticize them. We are willing to talk about them to others. We might engage in direct punishment of them. Uh, we might refuse to you know, stand next to them in the future or help them when they need help in the future. Allow our daughters to marry them is, is um, some of the context in which the Turkana expressed increased a motivation to sanction this individual. And, uh, the norms themselves are not just a superfluous, um, so the Turkana have a norm that says you shouldn't be a coward on a raid. You should go on raids and when you go there you need to fight and you need to fight in a way that, that is you know, in the interest of this larger group. Um, and these norms have a really profound effect on um, how people are living and dying. So in the Turkana context, um, as I said earlier, 
50% of adult male mortality is coming from raiding. So individuals are taking on a cost and part of the, at least part of the reason they're taking on this cost is because if they are seen as cowards, um, they are going to face a whole range of social sanctions that sometimes just make it worthwhile to then, you know, do the thing that's expected of you in that society. Another example of a kind of hypothesis we can test in contemporary populations. So now that we have some sense that people comply with social norms because there'll be sanctions towards individuals who don't, we have a situation in which different groups can have different norms because in each group they might be enforcing a different norm. We are not enforcing the same norms here as the Turkana are enforcing in the Quatella land, clearly. And that is essentially one of the biggest um, kind of outcomes of norm-based life, is that different populations can have different normative systems leading to different behaviors. And this means that groups can have differential success in intergroup competition. So uh, norms then, because of this process of generating between group variation, can create really novel competitive regimes that operate in human evolution. So imagine we have groups that have different norms. And so here I have the red norm as a norm that is a non-cooperative or a less cooperative norm. It's a norm that says, just help the people I know. Anybody else, you know, I'm not obliged to help. And a blue, the blue norm is a more cooperative norm. It says, help people anyone who adheres to the same norm that I adhere to. So don't restrict my helping to just the people I know. So the blue norm can allow cooperation to happen at a much larger scale. And there are lots of benefits to these kinds of large scale cooperation. You can produce public goods on much larger scales. You can mobilize much bigger armies, more effective armies. Um, and as a result, we might see that groups that have these more cooperative norms have differential success. They will take over um, groups that, that have less cooperative norms. And this process also does something else. As you notice, this blue norm is one that says, cooperate with anyone who shares my norm. And that means that now you have cooperation at a much bigger scale. You have cooperation across certain social boundaries across, or across bigger spatial scales. So you have larger scale cooperation emerging and you have cultural differentiation happening across these larger scales. So now the groups that are different is basically this big blue group and, and so the cultural boundary has shifted um, to a different social scale. What this, what this process generates then, and how we can test this, whether this is happening, is to look at today's populations and see whether you see this, this outcome. And this, by this outcome, I mean that the scale at which people cooperate is going to be the scale at which you see cultural differentiation. And we've done studies in uh, huge parts of Northwest Kenya that have spanned the areas of the Turkana, the Burana, the Rendile, um, and the Samburu, and uh, with different clans and sub-territories within these groups, and shown that indeed, that is what we find, the, uh, people are willing to cooperate with individuals who share their cultural norms. Um, and essentially, the scale at which you see cultural differentiation emerging is also the scale at which you see cooperation 
getting limited. So people are cooperating within those scales of cultural, culturally similar individuals. Uh, another hypothesis um, that we could have is if norms have played such a big role in human evolution, and that means they've imposed such huge costs on humans who have violated norms, then we should also have evolved behavioral mechanisms that allow us to uh, limit the social damage we experience if we do commit a norm violation. So protective measures of repair, social repair. And that has led us to uh, studying um, one context in which this is, um, this is potentially um, uh, happening, and that's the context of combat-related post-traumatic stress disorder. So in this study, we um, showed that uh, the Turkana warriors, who as you know, experience high rates of mortality from warfare, um, both as perpetrators and as victims, are basically um, exposed to big risks. And a large number of them, 28%, showed symptom severity scores that would qualify them for a provisional PTSD diagnosis. And um, what we are hypothesizing is that if the, that the evolved psychology of combat-related fear response should be prepared to mitigate not just the physical risks of combat, but also a whole bunch of moral risks that come from potentially violating social norms in this really high stakes context in which uh, people are getting killed. And uh, we did find um, some support for this hypothesis in the Turkana. Uh, we found that combat exposure, that is exposure to the physical risks of combat shown in yellow, uh, has a bigger effect on explaining PTSD symptoms that have to do with reacting to physical danger. So a startle response, hypervigilance, um, nightmares, so reliving the, um, the experience. Uh, and Exposure to moral violations, either as perpetrators or victims, that's the predictors shown in blue, have a relatively larger effect on explaining the depressive symptoms associated with PTSD, which some people have posited are symptoms that have to do with um, mitigating social damage and so and kind of trying to engage in social repair mechanisms changing course from what you're doing because you perceive that this is a um, not not the right thing to do um, etc and that helps us understand also what is happening in um, not just in one cultural context but across different cultural contexts because we know that the normative landscape of human warfare then would be very different if norms are what's making people, you know, take risks, go and, you know, wage war with one group of people, not another group of people. And um, there are lots of reasons to think that in the U.S., and in formal military systems that have this hierarchical structure in which soldiers have very little autonomy, um, over what they're doing, that there's much greater risks that they'll be in positions in which they're forced to commit violations of their norms. Um, and as expected, we saw that both the Turkana and the U.S. have similar rates of these reactions to physical danger symptoms. That's shown in the orange cloud which lies along this 45 degree line which shows that both populations have similar levels. But the US has relatively higher rates of the depressive symptoms of PTSD. Um, and this could again be because of the different normative landscape in which the wars are being fought in these uh, two populations. So now, um, Going back to a question, um, how, uh, question about the savanna. So how did the Turkana then adapt to the semi-arid savanna? And what does anything that I have said so far have to do with this question? Um, so 
The one thing um, to say up front is that I don't think we have a very good answer to this question. We don't know what exactly it is about the Turkana cultural complex and the Turkana normative systems that allowed them to thrive in a semi-arid savanna habitat. But whatever explanation we do end up coming with, coming up with, has to account for one really interesting observation, which is that, so here in red, is the current territory of the Turkana, a population that now numbers about a million people. So you can see that's a pretty big chunk of all the area that is west of Lake Turkana. Um, and it looks like, you know, when you look at this Google Maps, it is uh, much less green than some of the surrounding areas. It is a semi-arid, it's on the arid end of the savanna, the, gr the big range of savanna habitats that Denise has described. So the puzzling thing, though, is that they came to occupy this area only within the last 200 years. And about 200 years ago, they were a small population that was living somewhere in Uganda and were living up the rift escarpment where it is much wetter and much greener. And the people who were living there, their, their ancestors, their cultural ancestors, were people who were practicing agro-pastoralism in which there was actually a substantial amount of crops that people relied on and growing of crops along with the um, mobile pastoralism. But the area that the Turkana now occupy is much drier and there's almost no, none, none of this area in which people can actually do the agro part of the agro pastoralism. So the Turkana are much more heavily reliant on pa pure pastoralism. And uh, the interesting thing, I think, is that before the Turkana got there and spread over all this area, there were other people who were living there, and they were pastoralists, and they presumably had cultural adaptations to live in these semi-arid environments, and they had clearly lived there longer than the Turkana had lived there and had more time to accumulate some of the cultural know-how for doing this. Yet, it's the Turkana that displaced them. Today, it's the Turkana cultural complex that's occupying this big area. And one of the things that, one of the possibilities this raises is that the real, um, the underlying factor in the ad adaptive complex that the Turkana has brought with them to live and thrive in the semi-arid savanna has to do with the social normative system that they had and less to do with the specifics of a particular habitat. Um, and that particular social system then is a system of norms that people comply with and people enforce and um, that somehow allowed them to cooperate at large scales and even larger scales than potentially other groups and allow them to outcompete um, the other cultural groups or absorb those other cultural groups into their cultural milieu. So I'll conclude by saying that the norm-structured landscape that humans have inhabited have deeply shaped cooperation and conflict in humans. And um, what I've shown you today is basically a micro window into this. And it's understand, but it's all we have is the dynamics of the present. And if we can gain some insight into how these things are playing out, how these processes are playing out in the present, we gain some insight then into the forces that could have shaped human societies over longer evolutionary timescales because these behavioral adaptations of norm compliance, norm enforcement, and between group competition as a result of that, these are 
part of the human behavioral package. It's not part of just what the Turkana do. It's part of what all humans do. And this is um, clearly, if this is happening in the small context, this has played out in the bigger time scales in which humans have evolved and human evolution has uh, happened. So thank you.